and I'd like to introduce Jeff Weiss to, uh, now that I've sermed off all those softballs for him, to uh, tell us how they're going to spend all that money. I see that he can't afford a tie, but I... I uh, gets the lead on me. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be here, actually. I was trying to ask last night, how many of these have you done? Ten. 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 Jeff has been at nine of them. I skipped one on purpose, as you know, but at any rate, I wanted to welcome everybody to come here, and thank you so much for showing up. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. Actually, the sessions on the side are almost more interesting to me than these sessions. When we sit down with people and just talk through issues, it's really beneficial. So, I don't know about the embrace, the, the conflict, you know, I think that we embrace the conversation. So um, I wanted to uh, also acknowledge Carl. Carl has for nine years set me up every time the same way as a friend. Carl is a friend and I think I'm, I'm glad to say that. Um, but he always plays a video right before I come on that it's usually more dramatic than this one. So he must have been feeling generous this year or something. They're usually more dramatic and they have an industry failure with an explosion and a fireball and smoke. And then he said, now Jeff. So to, to get even with Carl, I decided not exactly to swing at what he asked me to, but I promised to answer his question at the end of it. So anyway, I'm thank, thankful to uh, be here. I was uh, looking over and Carl was kind enough to show me the agenda when he was in the formative stages. And he took very little of my suggestion, I will say, but. There, there was a couple of things in here I felt like were personal shots. This one about how old is too old, you know, that's one of them I could take personally, Carl. Um, I think the one that I really would encourage people to talk to is what Carl was just talking about. It is this issue, um, our, the cost-benefit analysis that's part of rulemaking. If you don't understand rulemaking, uh, I highly encourage you to go to that. I think you will find it very informative and maybe answer some of the questions you have about where are things going. So Carl's still working on a Macintosh, so here's where I am. I thought I would talk to you just really quickly about my favorite topic, um, then I would get into talking about fiscal year 2015. We operate on a fiscal year basis. It's October 1st, basically around to October 1st. Then I'll answer Carl's question about budget and people. One of my favorite topics, excavation damage prevention. And I have annually challenged the Pipeline Safety Trust and its board to do more in this area. If you care about people's lives and safety, you have to step up in the excavation damage prevention area. This, by the way, is a children's art. We sponsor, Karen Lynch is here. By the way, I should have stopped for two seconds. Forgive me for not doing this sooner. We have a lot of people from FIMSA here. I just thought it, they should stand up and just wave at people so you understand. We're under a travel restriction, but we did send some of our top people. Karen and her folks sponsor an annual contest every year with kids about art on trying to teach the message of 811 and calling before you dig. Uh, I'm personally on the board of the Common Ground Alliance. I wear my, my pin proudly with that. We've asked kids, I think this is one of the greatest things. These kids come up with some fantastic things. We publish a calendar every year with their work in it, and we invite the winners to come in. There are contests. We take them to a baseball game you know, with their parents. Um, it's really it's so much fun, and these kids get really charged up. But if you really want to do something about um, pipeline safety and its impact on people, you will include a coverage of excavation damage. So, you carry a lot of weight, and I'd love to see her helping us out on that. You got to meet Marie Therese Dominguez. I'm very glad she's on board, and I'm thankful for her support. We have really worked uh, hard over the years to try to do some of the things that I know many of you want to see, and I'm very pleased by the fact that Marie Therese was able to move things that we had been fighting for at FEMSA for a long time, and I'm, I'm confident that with her help, we will move more. We're committed to doing things by the end of this year, and I'm optimistic that we will do it. So um, she's really added a lot of strength to that um, equation, and I just want to say that it wasn't that the people at FEMSA weren't trying. 
but we needed a champion, and she's been able to champion things for us, so my hat's off to you for that. Um, I do want to say that these are the themes that she already hit in her remarks, and I just wanted to say you'll be hearing these from us in a million ways, and you can talk to us about these. Um, I think that the imp important thing Marie, Teresa, and I were talking about was trying to get more alignment inside, too. You know, it's important to engage with external stakeholders, but we need to get people aligned inside. So we're being as efficient as we can. So a lot of work going underway. She mentioned some of it, the data assessment, organizational assessment. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. I do want to do a real quick, and I promise not to be too long with this, but I wanted to do a basic pipeline 101 because I feel that there's always new people in the crowd. They don't know us. They don't know the environment. And I'm sure that they can come to our website and find out a lot of things and Carl's website as well. But for those of you who are not well informed, I do want to say prior to 1970, the states regulated all pipelines. That's a fact, right? A series of high consequence events led the US Congress to create acts that really created, at that time, Research and Special Programs Administration and charged them with partnering with the states. We have 52 state members. We see Steve Allen's down here representing Napster, and I think Alan Rathman is there as well. So several of our state partners are here. You'll be hearing from them as well. We're pleased to partner with these people. We work together very closely, and we each have important missions in our own right. So at the time, you know, the Congress was driven to create this and get improvements made. So a lot of what you see in the Code of Federal Regulations was based on existing consensus standards at the time. Um, these were technical standards. We, over the years, and with your help in prodding, have improved those, and we intend to do more in that area. But just so you know, they were built on existing standards and then adjusted as we go. Carl mentioned some of the other additional standards that are coming on, and there's evaluation of that as well. There's roughly 200 in, um, inspectors on board now at FIMSA, but as Marie Therese had said, we're pushing hard, and we're optimistic about hiring the remaining parts. I'll get to that in a moment. But there's, just so you don't lose track, there are at least 330, I, th I think the numbers are about right, state inspectors out there almost every day, you know, working on your behalf, largely in the distribution network. It's not entirely, you know, but largely in gas distribution, the gas that goes up to your house, that fuels your stove, your water heater, you name it. But these people are on the line every day and they're working that issue. They have slightly different missions than FIMSA, but I'm, I'm really proud to partner with these people and I think they do great work, so you, they deserve your thanks as well. Uh, so an, another thing I wanted to point out is that FIMSA is a multi-spectral creature. We talk in this forum a lot about regulation and enforcement, and that is important conversation. We should always talk about that, the regulation and enforcement. But I want to talk to you a little bit today about some of the other things that we do, just so you understand who FIMSA is more. We run it. Um, a failure investigation program. In fact, we're strengthening that program right now. Marie Therese and others are helping us lead the creation of an accident investigation division where we will uh, sharpen our skills, do more, do faster, you know, do better quality accident investigations. That is our opportunity to learn and to communicate with you all. With the states, with the industry, this is what we're finding. These are things we think need to be done about it to prevent it again in the future. So critically important, failure investigation. Um, the other thing we do is you saw that 550 or plus inspectors, we do all the training for those people out of our facility in Oklahoma City. We are adapting at, at Napster's request to try to do more distance learning because it is very difficult to people to go to Oklahoma City all the time. So I think we, I'm really optimistic. We brought on a new gentleman, Doug White, who has a lot of experience with training in the Army, and he's going to help us modernize that program. But I'd say state and federal inspectors who go into the field 
are all certified. They basically go through nine weeks of training, and some of them go through more of that, the advanced stuff. So just wanted you to know that's a fairly important effort. Marie Therese mentioned data collection and analysis. There is more going on. There was one good question about what other things do you want to do as far as data go. I do want to tell you we have fought, um, and the administration has supported us for a number of years in something we called NPICS, the National Pipeline Information Exchange. The states have 80% plus of the infrastructure they oversee, but yet the data that we're able to exchange with is too limited. You know, we need to be able to tell you what the national picture is, not just what the FEMSA picture is. I've seen reporters get confused over this issue. You know, where they, they talk about what FIMSA is doing and then compare what's happening nationally when we're overseeing roughly 20% of the infrastructure. But I do want to say the states have a lot of data, and our, the trick in that is to develop a magic decoder ring that doesn't create burdensome requirements for the state to have to enter in two different places. We can take their data, channel it through, and put it back in our database and make it available to you for a broader analysis. Uh, Ken Lee is here. Ken is our Director of Engineering and Research. If you don't know Ken, I would encourage you to talk to him. He'll be doing a panel later. Ken is national level expertise on welding. If you have any welding questions whatsoever, I would talk to him. There's probably very few people who can answer it as thoroughly as he can. But he also runs an important research program. This is uh, one, as uh, Marie Therese said, we collaborate in a lot of areas with people, including the trust and others. We do research and development. Um, on the innovation front, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our CAP program, which I'm, I'm very proud of. It's really an attempt to try to get what, what Jeff you know, calls left field engineering. Want to get out of the gene pool of people who have been thinking about problems the same way forever and bring in some new talent. So we've gone to academic institutions. I was on a telephone conference the other day. It was just uh, kind of really exemplifies what's going on. There was two universities involved, Arizona State, and I think it was uh, in the University of Colorado in Boulder. But there were 20 graduate students, um, four of them postdoc, the rest of them masters. I think there were four undergraduates involved in trying to solve a problem that we all had come up in our R&D forum on the collaborative agenda. I think this is really important to get people coming from other fields in there and self-servingly, a lot of young talent that can be recruited, you know, drawn into once they see how important the work is that we all do together, I think they'll be drawn to our work. And I'm hoping a lot of them come to public service. We can use that. We talk about regula uh, regulatory and standards development all the time. I think that's probably old hat here, but we incorporate something on the order of 60 to 70 consensus standards. They're all accredited by the American National Standards Institute. These are well-developed documents. We manage 52 state partner grant programs doing uh, grant coordination. Zach Barrett's over here. Zach does, he carries a lion's uh, load of that on his shoulders, but Chris McLaren is here as well. Chris is part of that group. They do a lot of work with the states all throughout the year, so I think they can speak to that, and Zach will be talking soon on that. The last part, which I think, and Karen is here from the uh, program development side, it's the side I ran actually for a number of years before I got tricked into taking this position. Program development was a good place to be. There's public awareness in there. There's damage prevention that's in there. There's communications, public communications. We have our CATS engineers who go out to communities to try to answer technical questions they have. We have PIPA, which Carl um, was one of the champions for PIPA for years. That's land use planning near pipelines. Um, and then our mapping system, which allows you to have access at a zip code to county level to whoever is near you operating a pipeline. So there's room to grow in, in uh, pipeline mapping, and we're on our, our path there. Just really quickly, I'm putting this in here, I'm not gonna dwell on it, but I, I wanted to, for those of you who are relatively new to the field, to understand the size of the magnet, or the magnitude of the infrastructure that we and our state partners oversee. Roughly 2.6, 2.7 million miles of pipe, um, about 3,000 or so operators, and this is everything from, I mean it, mom and pop, I mean that, mom and pop, 
um, to the Exxon Mobiles of the world and larger companies, Enterprise, and all of these really large companies. The level of sophistication and their ability to do what's in the regulations varies widely. And so to have an effective regulation, people need to know how to implement it. The states spend a lot of time with this, municipalities, for example, um, pretty important. So um, I'll show these a couple of stats really quick. I won't dwell on these, but this is one I like. And I apologize for the fact it's a little dated. I couldn't get the last year of data that I have. The full year of data is 14 in time, but you get the point. The bottom half of the graph talks about accidents with death or major injury and spills with environmental consequences. You see kind of the variation within there. I'll show you a more tight shot on those in a second. I just wanted to make the point that this is all occurring at the same time that population is growing, population is encroaching along pipeline rights away. So fundamentally, the risk surrounding pipelines is growing on a regular basis. Here's a record on pipeline incidents with death and major injury. These are part of the US Department of Transportation scorecard. Um, they're showing basically a 10% reduction every three years. And if you see major hazardous liquid pipeline spills, you'll see the, roughly the same trend. This is up year to year. But I, if, if you'll allow me, I'll hammer home the point that Carl made. I don't think we'll get to zero through regulation and enforcement only. You know, it's an important tool, so I'm not diminishing it in any way. But I'm saying there's more that needs to be done, you know, and some of these things that Carl was pointing out are areas that we can collaborate on. I did want to make one last final point on statistics. Alan's giving a presentation later on in the conference I think you'll find useful. One of the things that we do is uh, we'll, we'll do civil penalties, which, by the way, are collected and sent to the general treasury, right? That's the end goal of, of penalties. We also do a lot through corrective action order, which are things that we direct improvements that must be made to the system and investments that must be made. We do safety orders that deal with more longer term type issues. These are also directives and we do compliance orders in a lot of our violation cases. These are actions we direct must be taken. You can see here, there's kind of a lag in this because it takes a couple of years for a major enforcement case to play out. This next slide presents a lot of the punchline for that. What I'm saying, if you're looking for an investment in safety into the system and protecting citizens in the environment around the system, FEMSA has an incredible impact through the corrective action orders that we direct, through the safety orders and through the compliance orders, but they don't really get much visibility. You know, the only thing that's getting visibility are civil penalties, and I'll tell you, those are important. They are a deterrent, right? Against non So I'm not shirk shirking in any way from civil penalties. I just wanted you to see that there's a lot more to that picture than just civil penalties. Um, really quickly, uh, selected highlights for the next year, really, that we're going to be working on. We are committed and remain committed to resolving all outstanding mandates from the U.S. Congress, recommendation from the NTSB, the IG, and the Government Accountability Office. There shouldn't be any doubt about that. We are uh, committed and we have actions underway with people's name on it and timelines to take care of all those things. So we're fighting a good battle and I'm counting on Marie Therese's help in pushing those things over the top, giving us guidance on some of them where we're struggling and helping us push them over the top. We're gonna modernize uh, in two important areas I wish we had time to talk more about on LNG and oil spill rules. There's a lot of stuff happening on LNG because of the gas, amount of gas in this country, small scale liquefaction facilities that want to move that fuel into multimodal use. I'm telling you, that's coming because of all this gas. They've got to find a place to use it. Um, and the oil spill rules, which really were written some time ago. I'm proud of the, the program that Dave Lehman, who is our guy in DC, has really modernized his conduct of the program, but the rules need to be beefed up. So we'll be taking steps on that. We're going to beef up, uh, sorry, before that, we'll finish, as I said, we're going to finish recruitment. Um, I'll get to one, one point I want to make on that and step up training. We've built boot camps. I'm sure these guys are gonna, and gals are going to love being sent to our boot camp. We are there for a few weeks at a time just doing nothing but pipeline safety training. But it's the only way to get them up to speed and into the field where they can make a real impact. We'll be beefing up state, state programs oversight. We're adding people there. Um, we do a lot of mentoring. We do a lot of training for new program managers. The states have a lot of turnover there as well, so important. Um, 
one of my personal pets is this whole issue of safety management systems. And I think it's really hard to grasp what's the significance of that. We've talked about it, Carl, so I can tease him a little bit since I have the mic. You know, the first time I asked Carl about putting SMS on the agenda, it must have been two or three years ago, and Carl asked me, what kind of voodoo is that, you know? And we did sessions, so thankfully Carl listened, and we did sessions on it. I am here to tell you that I think that has great promise to help us get us from the gap between where we can get on regulations and enforcement and zero. And I think we all share the goal of zero. Um, there's no lack of commitment to zero on anyone's part. It's how you get there, and I think this is one of the magic keys. I do want to commend to you, if this is voodoo to you, you don't know much about safety management systems, we did a workshop, and I'll say no thanks to me, you know, it came out really well. Um, it, we invited people in from aviation, chemical industry, nuclear industry, and other high hazard industries that had adopted safety management systems approaches, and you can listen to them. If you go out to YouTube, search FEMSA plus SMS, and look for the February 2014 workshop. There are a lot of presentations in there. It's really good stuff. I think it was one of the best workshops we've done recently. You'll hear Alan Mayberry, who's a deputy for policy and planning um, and a critical linchpin, really, in the pipeline program. I th you'll hear him talk a lot more about metrics coming up, and I look forward to that. You'll hear Ken Lee talk, and amongst the things, is trying to ramp up. We need to talk to the industry about doubling and tripling our efforts on research. It really, finding better technological solutions is part of that answer about how you drive to zero. So um, now to Carl's question. So Carl was listening a little bit. Here's a chart which you could send I strain now, and actually for me it's a little out of focus, but at any rate, maybe because I'm too close. I wanted to answer your question with some detail. The thing I'm really happy about is the, and which you think about the most, is the inspection enforcement staff row, which is at the bottom. These are the people who are in the field. As you see, we're going to 250. They're out there, 50% of their time is spent traveling, looking, physically examining facilities. The other 50% is spent in a variety of things, but part of it is back in the office going through these reams of records and examining you know, the moving enforcement cases, you name it. But we're also growing the rest of the program, as I mentioned. So as you look at the grants program, and one, of, one of Carl's answers is if you look at it, go to 14, it was kind of static for a while. We had a jump after about 2008, so the, the state guys can tell us. That money is used almost exclusively for the support of state programs personnel, just pure and simple. It's not like they're out there buying mega IT systems with his money. They're recruiting people, and we're all for that. The states could beef up, you know, as much as we can get, we'll take. But a lot of that money, Carl, went into state grant programs, so that'll go directly to hiring people, and I think a lot of the states have been doing that, so really excited about that part. You saw the R&D program uh, got a jump there in 14, so it doubled. It's actually its authorization, and I think it's right at the authorization from about eight years ago. So we're finally there, more needs to be done. When you look at FIMSA side of it, I think the thing you need to keep in mind is the way Congress apportions money to uh, federal agencies, and I think wisely. The first year, they give you 50% of the salary that you need because they assume it'll take six months for you to hire. The next year, they give you the full year of salary. So we have not gotten that in 16. Now, we're still under a continuing resolution. I want to thank Marie Therese has gone to bat for us and talked to the Hill, both on the House and the Senate side, to say we need that annualization of funds so we can meet payroll, but we're committed to doing the full recruitment regardless. I just have to scratch my head a little bit to figure out how we'll pay for part of the payroll and expenses, but we will do it. So part of it, Carl, is I think the Congress has been very generous, and I want to thank them for their support for that. We are beefing up our efforts, um, <clears throat> and I think more needs to be done. This is just a little detail on where we allocated those positions. As you can see, most of them went to the field. Vaz Zaganos is here. She's our acting chief counsel. Vaz will be on the program in just a bit. But we've moved a bunch of attorneys into enforcement. They'll help us speed up enforcement, making sure we do it better. 
you can see the allocation in the state program grant. So I'm going to close, Carl. I probably went long, as is my tradition. But I did want to say and drive home this message is that it's trite to hear this, but pipeline is a shared responsibility. The longer I've been in this game, and I've been here almost 17 years in this job, is that there are lots of good, well-meaning people who don't understand that they own a piece of the pipeline safety equation. Our job is to engage those people and make sure that they know how to effectively carry out their part of it, whether it's emergency responders where we spent over $8 million providing what turned out to be award-winning training for emergency responders throughout America, you know, whether it's state program managers where we can support them with a world-class training facility, whether it's advocates who we, we sit down regularly and talk to them about what their issues are. We try to have frank and candid conversations. Um, Carl's taken to buying beer in order to get answers to his, and it, it seems to have been pretty effective, I guess, so far. But I want to say property developers and others all have roles here. PIPA was not a mandate to us. We decided to take that on. It was about land use planning where communities keep building closer and closer to pipelines so the risk is growing. You can't do it, you need to manage it. You know? So let's make sure they have the tools to do it smartly. We could use some help on PIPA and I, that's not directed at Carl because the trust has done a lot on that front for us and I think we need everyone's room partner. So I won't go into the rest of this stuff, but I will tell you that I'm really proud to be at FIMSA and working for, with, for the people in FIMSA and working for you every day. I'm, I'm confident that the people in FIMSA are working really hard and they're dedicated to the safety mission. I have no doubt in my mind. I think you should be proud of them and they work really hard on your behalf. So Henry, thank you much.